Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the invite today. Dan is a professor of computer science at Stanford University. That's in the field of applied cryptography and security. And he probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. He is one of the most prominent academics working in our space. Um, I need some intersection and cryptography and blockchains. So welcome to that. Great, thank you, Lara. All right, so uh, I guess it, this is a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for, uh, for inviting me. I've been spending a, a couple of days in the lab. This is like a, an awesome place to visit. I highly recommend anyone who's watching should apply to visit the lab. Really awesome energy going on here. So wonderful, wonderful spot. And also this uh, seminar series is fantastic. It's such a wonderful resource that goes on YouTube. I hope everybody's watching the YouTube videos, whether in, a lot, in li a live or uh, when they go up on, on YouTube. OK, so uh, let's get started. So today what I wanted to talk about is this concept, uh, what's called a secret, uh, single secret leader election. It goes by the name of SSLE. It's gotten some attention uh, recently. And so I wanted to talk about some recent results, in particular how to make uh, post-quantum secure uh, SSLE. And this is based on joint work with uh, Anidhi Pratap and uh, Leo Rotem. Oh, and I should say also this is going to appear in, in AFT, uh, Advanced, what is it? Advances in Financial Technology. AFT is an awesome blockchain conference. Everybody should go to AFT and submit their uh, best paper, best, best work to AFT. We need, we need a blockchain-focused uh, conference, and AFT is, is a good candidate for that. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, what is the problem with SSLE? So let's start with a quick review of uh, where we uh, come from, right? So we start with uh, proof-of-work systems or proof-of-work consensus. And you guys know in proof-of-work consensus, there are a bunch of miners that generate uh, that generates blocks. They each work to solve uh, a particular puzzle. And when somebody solves the puzzle, they basically post the solution to the puzzle along with a block, yeah? So in some sense, in some sense at the time that the block is posted, there's also a proof that the person that's posting the block is the elected leader, and there's no gap between posting the block and electing the leader. Yeah, that's in proof of work systems. And then when we transition to proof of stake systems, uh, what happens all of a sudden, we introduce a gap. Yeah, so in a proof of stake systems, typically a leader gets selected. Yeah, so the, you know, the system says, you know, you are the leader, you are the block proposer for this, uh, for this slot. And then sometimes later, the leader goes ahead and uh, posts their block. Yeah, so there's a gap between the leader election time and the time that the block is posted. And this introduces a bit of an issue in that uh, what can happen is, uh, you know, the block proposer is known in advance. So the point is that now you know who is going to propose the block. So you can go ahead and uh, attack that particular block, block proposer. For example, you can DOS them. Maybe you can bribe them. You can do all sorts of things to prevent them uh, from publishing the block. And as a, as a result, boom, you get, uh, you get a hole. There's no block published in the system. And so what does, this, what does the system do? It moves on to the next leader. But the next leader is also uh, known in advance. So now everybody just shifts their DOS attack to the next, next leader and uh, so on and so forth. And so you get a whole bunch of gaps in the, in the chain. And as a result, you hurt the, the liveness of the chain. Okay, so that's the problem that, uh, that we'd like to solve. So by the way, even in, uh, in Ethereum 2, uh, the leaders are kind of known in advance. And so uh, this could lead to uh, kind of a sequence of, of, of holes if in fact somebody tries to repeatedly attack the elected leaders. So what do we do? So first of all, I guess I wanted to point to this uh, wonderful uh, uh, survey. It's a blog post by uh, Chris, Lara, and uh, Joe that kind of goes through different uh, leader election mechanisms. Everybody should read this blog post. Very, very good survey uh, of this area. Uh, and so uh, let's kind of look, about, look at what, what are the options. So one thing we can do is, uh, well, we can try to use a consensus protocol that doesn't have a leader. Yeah? So it's a leaderless uh, consensus protocol. And one example is uh, Red Belly Consensus as a paper from 2021. Um, so that's one option. But you know, most uh, protocols that we use do actually have a leader. And so what else can we do? So the other approach, uh, of course, which many of you might be uh, familiar with, is what's called a secret leader election. Sometimes this goes by the name of probabilistic leader election or, or PLE probabilistic leader election. Sometimes this is called the VRF method. So it has, goes by a lot of names. Um, and the way it works, I guess this is what's used by, uh, by, Arbor, uh, by Algorand, by uh, Ouroboros, Paras, and so on. So the way this works is, uh, again, I'm going to give a very high level description. But the way this works is basically every validator has um, a number k. We'll call it vk. This number k comes from, from a VRF. But let's not worry about that. Let's just imagine the, the validator has a number k. And then uh, when it's time to choose a leader, basically, to keep things simple, we'll say that a random beacon publishes some 256-bit number R. 
And the leader is the, is the validator that has the closest number to, uh, to R, or more precisely, the leader is the, is the uh, validator who is close enough to R that the difference is uh, you know, the range divided by the number of validators overall. Yeah, so an expectation, you'll expect that there's roughly one leader, ele well, an expectation, there's exactly one leader uh, elected every time. But you see what the problem with this is. The problem, of course, is that the probability that no leader is elected, because we have the strict inequality to satisfy, no leader is elected or multiple leaders are elected, this probability is not negligible. And as a result, all these systems have to deal with these corner cases where nobody got elected or multiple people got elected. Somehow there's a runoff, often there's a runoff election between the elected leaders, leaders. And so there's kind of more logic that needs to go into place uh, when we use PLE. Yeah, probabilistic leader election. It's a great way to secretly elect a leader because nobody knows who the leader is until they publish their VK. So we do have a secret leader election mechanism, but it's not a single secret leader election because we might be electing multiple leaders or no leaders at all. Yeah, so that's kind of a, the problem that we set out uh, to solve. So what we would like to use is actually what's called a single secret leader election mechanism, which has all the properties of PLE. The leader is secret but you are guaranteed that there's only one leader elected every, every time. Yeah, so let's see, the properties we'd like to have is, uh, it should be fair, so all the parties are equally likely to be elected, or you know, if it's a stake-based system, maybe it's weighted by their stake. Uh, we'd like the system to be unpredictable, which means that the leader remains secret, you have no idea who got elected, until the leader decides to reveal themselves. When will they reveal themselves? Most likely they'll reveal themselves when they publish the block, not before. Yeah, but until they choose to reveal themselves, they should remain uh, secret. And then it should be unique. This is a single property. There should be exactly, provably, exactly one leader gets elected. Not zero, not two, not three, exactly one. Yeah, so those are the three proper properties uh, we're trying to satisfy. So let's just look at the trivial uh, protocol to do this. So the trivial protocol would be, well, if we have a random beacon that just generates you know, randomness for us, um, well, when we just have the random beacon, choose one of the end parties. Yeah, and, and we're done. So let's see. So that is guaranteed to be fair because we're choosing one party at random from the end parties. It's guaranteed to be unique because the beacon is choosing exactly one of the end. But of course, it's completely predictable because once the beacon is public, you know exactly who the leader is going to be, and then you can go and DOS them. Okay, so the trivial mechanism using a beacon doesn't actually work. Now, surprisingly, actually building a secure SSLE protocol, this turns out to be a lot harder than, uh, than we think. This is actually not, a not an easy primitive uh, to satisfy. I'll show you some constructions in just a minute, but kind of constructions that, for example, don't use a random beacon, they end up using fairly heavy cryptographic tools. Yeah, so it's like, this is not an easy thing uh, to construct. And we're gonna go through a couple of the constructions uh, in just a minute. So one thing that's interesting is there's this really uh, uh, nice paper by Azuvi and uh, Capaletti. Uh, this paper actually looks at a comparison of doing single secret leader election versus probabilistic leader election, where we might have, where, where it's secret, but we might have more than one leader elected. And what they looked at is particularly uh, private attacks against this proof of stake uh, consensus. This is a purely a combinatorial paper. Yeah, it's a combinatorial analysis uh, comparing the two. In part particular, if you uh, look at the uh, impact of these privacy attack and the longest chain uh, protocol, yeah, consensus protocol. And uh, you know, they're worried about what happens when the block producer keeps some uh, blocks to themselves. And they, surprisingly, I mean, they show that actually uh, SSLE results in faster consensus. Yeah, in particular, what that means is, um, you know, the time until you are confident that the block is really there is something like, you know, 25% faster with SSLE versus uh, with PLE when the attacker controls uh, a third of the stake. Yeah, so this really SSLE really um, uh, not only is a simpler logic, you don't have to worry about the case where you have multiple leaders, it actually leads to faster uh, settlement time, which is, uh, which is pretty interesting. This is specifically for longest chain? This is specifically for longest chain, and their, their analysis is only in synchronous networks. They kind of leave it uh, to other, other networks. They leave it as an open problem. It's kind of a cute, it's very cute. It's kind of a nice, it's purely combinatorial. It's not, this is not an experiment. It's a, like a purely combinatorial anal analysis uh, of what happens. And I guess I wanted to also mention that there's another aspect of uh, secret leader election, which we're not going to talk about. There's kind of the, um, you can kind of go all out on leader election, where you can say, well, what if I want even more privacy, right? You guys remember that in SSLE, what happens is when I publish my block, I reveal my identity. 
right? And perhaps even in SSLE, I reveal how much stake I have. Well, you can ask, well, what happens if I want to keep uh, the leader's identity private so nobody knows who published the block? Or I want to keep every, every validator's stake, I want to keep it private. Like, why, why should the world know how much uh, stake I put into, uh, into the consensus? So there's actually some work that focuses on full privacy. Uh, so I listed some, some papers here. Um, some var variations of Ouroboros and so on that uh, focus on complete privacy. But these systems, interestingly, so yeah, so they hide the stake and the identity of the, um, of the leader, but these systems basically are primarily their PLE-based systems. Yeah, so they still use uh, VRF-like mechanisms, um, uh, but for example, some of these papers just focus on what's called an anonymous VRF. So you know that the VRF value is correct, but you don't know which VRF value, which VRF it actually came from, and that's how you hide the identity of the leader. So again, they're not focusing on SSLE, which gives us advantages and consensus. These are just, they're focusing primarily on privacy and still staying in the PLE uh, realm. Um, cool, okay, so we're not gonna look at this model. We're gonna stick with the SSLE model where uh, you remain, the leader remains secret until they publish their block, and then everybody knows that that's who they are. Okay, so because of the, uh, these, these advantages in, in consensus, in fact, uh, if you look at the uh, Ethereum timeline, maybe this is kind of an old picture, actually. What is it, the merge and the surge and the plurge and whatever, you know, all the, all the, all, all the cute names that come up there. In fact, single secret, single secret leader election is kind of one of the uh, components that they're looking at. Uh, this is kind of a research area for the Ethereum Foundation, but hopefully this is something that we'll actually see uh, deployed uh, in, in, in a version soon. So that's interesting that... Um, it's actually getting some traction in practice as well. Also, when you look at uh, Aztec, Aztec put up an RFP recently. So Aztec wants, when they launch, they want to have a decentralized uh, sequencer. And so if they have a decentralized sequencer, they have to have a leader election protocol. And in fact, in this RFP, they specifically say, um, you know, we want to allow the sequencer the option of anonymity during the selection of the leader. Yeah. They might even want to do it during block submission, but particularly during the selection of the leader, they want to have leader privacy, so they're also looking at SSLE type, uh, type protocols. So um, yeah, so even it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that even L2s are interested in uh, SSLE these days. So yeah, so it's quite a kind of becoming kind of an important problem in the, in the blockchain space. Okay, so now that we have our background on, on SSLE, uh, let's look at some SSLE constructions. Yeah, so this area, really kind of uh, uh, got quite a lot of attention. And so let's look at a couple of constructions. So I guess this is something that uh, uh, our original paper from, it's by now ancient history, it's like almost 2020, it's like a long time ago in the world of blockchains, yeah? Uh, we basically gave a construction using a threshold fully homomorphic encryption, so no beacon, just, uh, but as I said, if you don't have a beacon, it turns out you need fairly, uh, uh, fairly, fairly powerful cryptographic tools. There's a construction, I should say, so using, using FHEs, one, one thing in the paper, we also give a construction just to show feasibility. We give a construction from IO. Uh, you can also give a construction from functional encryption. So these are pretty heavy cryptographic tools. You need to construct it like uh, from scratch. Uh, there's also another, oh, but by the way, I should say like the FHE, fully homomorphic encryption-based system, if you have N, N parties, you're trying to elect a leader among n parties, it turns out the multiplication depth of the circuit is only around log n. Yeah, and it's actually a fairly simple, constru fairly simple construction to describe. Maybe I won't do it here, but if you're in interested in seeing how it works, it'll take me literally two minutes to describe it. It's a very, very direct and simple construction. Um, the other approach, which is far more practical, is using what we call re-randomizable commitments, and that's actually what I'm going to talk about. So, yeah, so I'll talk about um, exactly about what, what re-randomizable commitments are in just a second. So this is the, in, the, in the original paper, and then the Ethereum Foundation actually went and optimized that. This is kind of what they would like to use, um, perhaps, in a future version of Ethereum. And uh, I'll mention also that there's uh, even a, a, a construction uh, due to Ca Catalano and all that, that gives stronger security uh, in, the, in, the in the sense that they look at uh, adaptive corruptions rather than uh, static corruptions. Then you can build it based on pairings. You can build it using MPC. Uh, and then uh, Sanso in, in the Ethereum Foundation even looked at constructions from isogenies. The reason, again, they were interested in post-quantum uh, SSLE. And so there is a construction uh, from isogenies uh, as well. Yeah, uh, isogenies... Unfortunately, the performance of isogenies is not as great as we would like. And so the natural question is, if we want to build a post-quantum system, what would we like to build it from? Can somebody say? What do we like to build post-quantum systems from? Lattices. Lattices, exactly. So the question is, can we... Ooh, sorry, I skipped a step. 
I forgot to say, to say that not all, so, uh, sorry, before we get to lattices, well, fine, I'll say it. So the question is, can we build SSLE from lattices? But if we look at the existing families of constructions, well, FHE is built from lattices, so it's inherently uh, post-quantum, but FHE is pretty heavy weight mechanism. Yeah, so we'd like to use something that doesn't have to rely on FHE. All these previous constructions were based on discrete log and pairing. They fall apart in the uh, uh, post-quantum world. Isogenies are post-quantum, and the MPC methods, well, it depends on which MPC you use. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the state of the world. And the question that was open is, can we have a post-quantum SSLE? By the way, the reason uh, we started looking at this, it's also kind of a philosophically interesting uh, question, which uh, also came to us from the Ethereum Foundation. And they, they, they said that for every cryptographic primitive they deploy, they would like to have, even though it's pre-quantum today, they would like to have a post-quantum variant so that if, you know, oh my God, tomorrow we open the New York Times and it says somebody in the world built a quantum computer, the Ethereum Foundation has, they know what to do. They know what to deploy. So for everything, it's quite a, uh, very, it's a very good philosophy. Actually, for everything they deploy, they want to have a post-quantum variant. Maybe they don't deploy it right away, but they want to have it in their pockets instead in, in case they need, it, uh, they need it in an emergency. So for SSLE, we need to have a post-quantum version. All right, so let's go and, and build one. And the one that I'll focus on, because they kind of chose uh, this approach, I'll fo will focus on post-quantum from re-randomizable commitments. And that turned out to be kind of an interesting question. And that's, what, that's what I want to tell you about. All right, so to explain how to build it, I first of all have to explain what are re-randomizable commitments and how, how do they come up in SSLE. So let's walk slow, slowly through the SSLE construction that uses re-randomizable commitments, and you'll see exactly what the problem is. All right, so we have our parties. So we have our N validators that we want to choose a leader from. The first thing that happens is called the commitment step. So what is the commitment, commitment step? Well, everybody basically generates some random number, and they commit to that number. So they publish a commitment of their number. They also publish a hash of that number. And the reason we publish that hash is to make sure that all the committed numbers are unique. Yeah, we don't want to have any duplicates. So this doesn't break the commitment. It just reveals enough information to argue that uh, the commitments are unique. OK, good. So that's just the setup, setup step. Now that we've done the setup, uh, what happens? So this happens at the beginning of time. Yeah, this is one time for the entire, the entire chain, or one time for many, many slots. So what happens next is now uh, we have the re-randomization phase, where a party wakes up. Yeah, so here, Alice woke up. And what she will do is she will shuffle all these commitments and re-randomize them. Okay, so they, she literally permutes them under a random permutation. But of course, just permuting is not enough, because uh, you can just look at the original commitments and the new commitments and figure out what the permutation is. So what she does, in addition, to permuting, she also re-randomizes the commitments so they don't look anything like the original commitments. Okay? And we keep doing that. Oh, sorry. And then she has to produce a proof that the shuffle was done correctly. Yeah, this is called a proof of shuffle that this is a zero knowledge proof that she permuted and re-randomized, but she didn't change any of the committed values. Yeah, so she didn't drop any commitments, she didn't add any commitments, and she didn't change any of the existing commitments. That's a proof of shuffle. And then we just do this over and over again. The parties just go ahead and every, everybody just uh, permutes. And then once they're done permuting, they're happy that kind of everything got permuted around. Um, what happens is we're going to use a beacon to randomly select one of these commitments. For example, the beacon says position number two is going to be my, uh, the leader. And now nobody knows who, uh, le who position number two is because everything got permuted. Yeah, so the leader is secret at this point. The leader is committed to it, selected. But nobody knows who the leader is because uh, nobody knows what is inside of the commitment. But when the leader is ready to publish their block, what they'll do is they'll reveal the fact that this is uh, K3 is their commitment and a proof that K3 is, in fact, uh, their, uh, their commitment. And then now they can publish the block. Yeah, does that make sense? So that's the process of uh, commit and shuffle. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so the commitments hide who, so we select one commitment that doesn't reveal who the leader is, but the leader can later on open the commitment and reveal that that's who they are. So that's the general framework for doing it. And so now the question is, what kind of a commitment scheme do we need to make this work? So what we need, well, okay, so, yeah. I think there's a question from our oh, Zoom yeah. chat. Oh, on Zoom chat. You can go to the chat. Yeah, so the question is, uh, oh, what does is, what is post-quantum alternative mean in practice? Oh, my God. 
Aline, you want to get you want to get philosophical? I see. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm just wondering, like, there are precompiles, right, that support clearly not post quantum cryptography, like elliptic curve arithmetic. So those seem really <laughs> tough to protect. Yeah. So I see. <laughs> okay. Uh, good question. Okay, this is this is a philosophical question. Like, what does it mean to be post quantum secure if you have pre quantum primitives precompiles deployed in the EVM? Uh, well, uh, your 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 guess is as good as mine. But I suppose if somebody comes up with a with a quantum co computer earlier than we expect, you know, presumably these precompiles will continue to exist. Um, but we will also add post quantum equivalent precompiles so people can migrate their 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 contracts. To these new to these new precompiles, this is by the way a pretty deep rabbit hole because, as you know, there's a way to immunize existing systems against a future quantum computer. Uh, but that's maybe that's a discussion for another another talk. Yeah. So thanks, Aline. This is a good good question, but that's a pretty that's kind of a long, long and complicated conversation. We can have that debate uh, not debate that conversation maybe uh, after the talk. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, please. And the whole transcript of this SSLE would go on chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of course, the SSLE transcript has to go on chain. And that's, a, that's an excellent question. And so what happens is, actually, here I'm describing a simplified version of, of the protocol. So here, we permute basically all the commitments. So every time, time we permute, we would have to uh, write it all on chain. There are optimizations that dramatically reduce the amount of, of communication. I'll get to that at the very end. Yeah, we don't. So, we can basically use, we don't have to permute everything. We can use a, a rapidly mixing, mixing shuffle, and then we only, only uh, touch a few commitments at a time. Yeah, so I'll, we'll, we'll get to that at the very end. Yeah. yeah. When the first person does the, the first permute, can they not just associate commitments with identities? Yeah, yeah, so this assumes, this assumes one honest party. So as long as one of the parties is honestly shuffling and not revealing uh, what the shuffle is, then, then at the end, you break the connection between the commitments and the validators. But, but I, can, I know what like commit of K1 is, right? So now I know a value that is associated with a person, then at the very end... No, no, you don't know what the, you don't know what the, the key is. You I don't just, know the key, but I, I know the commitment. Yeah, but the commitment changes every time. It's re the commitment gets re-randomized oh, every okay. time. Yeah, so the commitment changes as you walk through this process. Got it. Yeah, so at the end, by the time you get here, the commitment is unrelated to, your, to the original commitments. Why is the random begin necessary? Why can't you just say the first commitment is the, the winner? Yeah, there, okay, good. So there are, are some, some uh, technically, technical issues with that. Um, so let's see. So if you say that the first commitment is the winner, so the last shuffler basically could always place themselves first, and then they win. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, so, right. Yeah, so you don't want to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. Without, without a beacon, this is, uh, like I said, we need pretty heavy, heavy uh, tools to actually build this. OK. So let's look at the components that we need to make this construction work. OK, so what are the components that we need for this? So we need re-randomizable commitments, which we'll talk about in just a second. We need a proof of correct shuffle. And we need a randomness, randomness beacon, as we just, uh, just said. And the properties, you know, fairness is guaranteed by the beacon. It's going to choose one element at random. Unpredictability happens because of the hiding property of the commitments, and uniqueness happens because all the committed values are, uh, are distinct. OK, so let's talk about re-randomizable commitments and see, uh, see what they are. So what is a re-randomizable commitment? You can kind of already visualize uh, what's needed here, but let's go through it uh, carefully. So basically, there's a commit algorithm that will generate a commitment to a key, and then the key will become uh, available to the committer. Okay, so the commitment algorithm generates a key uh, for the committer. Then anyone can go ahead and re-randomize the commitment. And later on, uh, whoever holds the key can prove that this is their commitment. Yeah, so that's kind of a, at a high level what we'd like to achieve. The syntax for this is, you know, we set up the system with some public parameters. The commit algorithm generates a commitment and a key. There's a randomized algorithm that takes a commitment and re-randomizes it. And there's a verify algorithm that takes a commitment and a key and says, yes, this is a valid uh, key for this commitment or not. Yeah, those are the, that's the syntax for, these, uh, for the system. Let's go through uh, the requirements. So we'll say that this is t randomizable if you can re-randomize t times. Okay? So let's just see what that means. Basically, if I generate a commitment, so I have a, key, a commitment and a key, 
and I repeatedly randomize t times, so I iteratively randomize again and again and again and again uh, t times until I get a new commitment, then the verifier will still accept the key k for the re-randomizable commitment. That's if we do it up to t times. If you do t plus one times, maybe it doesn't work. But t times we can, uh, we can support. Uh, we also need it to be non-degenerate, meaning that if I generate two random commitments, the probability that I get different keys is almost one. Yeah, if I always got the same key, then we'd have a problem. Yeah, but uh, I'm gonna get uh, different keys with very high probability. And now let's talk about the security properties. So the first security property is binding, the standard binding property, which means that given a commitment, I cannot open it in two different ways. I can only open it in one way. And the unlinkability property is a little bit more tricky to define, but the unlinkability property goes as follows. Well, I'm gonna ask you to randomize uh, I, either I0 or I1 times. What I'll do is I'll generate one commitment, COM0, and I'll randomize it I0 times. I'll generate another commitment, COM1, and I'll randomize it I1 times. And the property is, maybe you guys can guess, but the property is that if I give you the two commitments, so you see the original commitments, and you see either the re-randomizable uh, zeroth commitment or first commitment, you can't tell which one you saw. Yeah, that's the unlinkability property. So once I re-randomize a commitment, you can't tell whether it came from COM0 or from COM1. They both look the same way. And this basically, again, means you, can un you cannot undo the permutation by just looking at the commitments. Because after re you re-randomize, they all look the same. That's kind of the unlinkability property. All right? That's what we're trying to construct. So the first question to ask is, does this even exist at all? Yeah, is there any way to construct this thing? And so the first observation is that uh, using discrete log, this is a trivial thing to construct. Yeah, under the decision Diffie-Hellman assumption, it's very, very simple to construct this. So let's just walk through the construction. You'll see it right away. Uh, basically, we're gonna fix a group, yeah, where the decision Diffie-Hellman problem is believed to be hard. And the way we commit is basically we're gonna choose a random key k, and then we're just gonna output the generator and the generator to the, to the k, g and g to the k. That's gonna be our initial commitment. Well, how do we re-randomize? If I give you a commitment, u comma v, you see a commitment is a pair of group elements. So I give you u and v, how do we re-randomize? Well, we're just gonna choose a random r, and we're gonna raise both u and v to the power of r. Now, already looking ahead, anyone who's familiar with DDA, with decision Diffie-Hellman, knows that once I raise things to the r, they sort of become pseudo-random. So you can't connect this to the original thing anymore. So good, so we're getting our good unlinkability properties. Uh, and then how do I verify? If you reveal k, yeah, if you, once you reveal k, it's easy to test that k is correct. Simply take the first element, take u, and raise it to the k, and check if that's equal to v. And you see that the re-randomization uh, preserves the discrete log relation between the two values. Yeah, so very simple. Like, the, the, uh, the binding property is easy, the unlinkability property is easy. Uh, there's a very simple theorem. This is, in fact, infinitely re-randomizable. Uh, it's binding and unlinkable, assuming, assuming DDH. What could, be, what could be easier and simpler uh, to use? Great. Not only that, in fact, this kind of, uh, kind of re-randomizable commitment also, have a very, also has a very good proof of shuffle. Yeah, this is what's called the Biogroth uh, proof of shuffle. So this is great. Like, everything is just, just hums along, and maybe this is why WISC actually uh, works as well as it does. Uh, and uh, so everybody's happy with this. The only problem with this construction is it's not quantum resistant. Yeah, so we gotta build something that's quantum resistant. So the question then is, how do we build re-randomizable re commitments from lattices? And this turns out to be a pretty interesting question because the first thing you try doesn't work, yeah? Okay, so uh, with lattices, everything is harder. Everything is harder, yeah? So here, it's nice and clean, very simple construction. Now let's switch gears and talk about the world of lattices and how do we actually build something like this uh, that's post-quantum secure. Okay, so a good starting point is, well, let's start from a lattice commitment scheme. Yeah, uh, let's say so here I'm gonna go slowly. Let me just kind of explain uh, how these lattices work. How do we use lattices in cryptography? By the way, I hope people are familiar with what a lattice is, right? A lattice is, uh, well, technically it's a discrete, uh, what is it, a discrete uh, subgroup of R to the N. That's the mathematical definition. The more human definition is, uh, you know, I give you a bunch of vectors in R to the N, and you take uh, all integer, oh, sorry, N vectors in R to the N, 
and linearly independent vectors in R to the n, and you take all integer linear combinations of those vectors. Yeah, that's a lattice. And there are lots of, of computational problems on lattices, and many of those problems are believed to be hard for a quantum computer, which is why we can build cryptography from lattices. Okay, so let's talk about how do we build uh, lattice commitments. Well, so when we use a lattice, we have to, first of all, fix a prime Q. Okay, so there's some prime. Uh, there are parameters because we're going to be dealing with matrices. Yeah, so there are uh, uh, matrices of dimensions m by n. And then there's often a noise distribution chi that generates uh, low norm noise. Like the numbers, the noise is going to be like numbers in the range minus 5 to 5. Yeah, so it's just some low noise uh, uh, noise distribution. And the way we, could, we can commit, the way we would generate a commitment in the re-randomizable commitment scheme is as follows. What we'll do is we'll, change, we'll choose a random matrix A. So this is a tall matrix. It's an M by N matrix. We'll choose a random key K, and then we'll choose a random uh, noise vector from the noise distribution E. And the way the commitment will work is, you know, K is going to be our secret key. And the commitment is going to be very similar to the G comma G to the R. We're just going to use the lattice equivalent of that. So the matrix is going to be uh, one element. And the other matrix, uh, the other element will be a times k plus some noise. Okay, this is an important component, a times k plus some noise. By the way, it's important to realize this is just a vector, right? So we're doing a matrix vector product, which gives us a vector, and then we're adding some noise to this vector. So the commitment looks like a matrix and a vector. That's it, okay? That's a very reasonable place uh, to start. Um, and so the question is, how do we re-randomize this? Yeah, that's the first question. So, uh, Maybe, I should, maybe I, uh, I should ask if anybody sees here. Let me kind of skip ahead. Uh, no. Uh, let's see. How do we verify? First of all, so the commitment is going to be a, a matrix and a vector. How do we verify that the key K is correct? Well, I'm going to reveal the key K. And what we're going to check, yeah, so here pay attention. How do we check that the key K is correct? We're going to compute the product B times K. This is a vector. And if, this, if K, K is the correct uh, key for this commitment, what will happen is that b times k is going to be close to the vector b. Yeah, let me just remind you why that's the case. If we look at the definition of b, b is going to be bk plus the noise vector. So if we take the vector, um, if we take the matrix b and multiply it by k, uh, basically what we're going to get is a vector that's off from b by uh, the vector e. And e is a low norm vector, right? So basically if these two are close, in other words, their difference is a low, no, low L2 norm vector, then we say that K is correct. So let me ask you, see if anybody can help me here. So how would we re-randomize this commitment? So we have a commitment, you know, matrix and a vector that satisfy that we want to preserve this relation, that B times K is close to the vector B. How would we re-randomize the commitments? Inspired by regular encryption, multiplied by Boolean matrix. Ah, yes, exactly, 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 exactly. That's exactly where we're headed. Perfect, thank you. So uh, what we're going to do exactly, we're going to do kind of, a, kind of a thing that comes up in, in, in lattices uh, quite a bit. And the way we re-randomize is we're going to choose a random sort of Boolean, you know, minus, minus one, plus one square matrix. It's not a rectangular matrix anymore, it's a square matrix. And what we'll do is we multiply both the matrix and the vector by this low norm, low norm matrix R. Okay, fine. This is all standard uh, lattice stuff so far. Now, why, why does verification, let's just verify, why does verification still work? Well, remember this relation. This is how the vector is defined. So why does this relation still work? Well, we multiply, if we multiply both sides by R, you see, we're multiplying both sides by the matrix R, the noise, the difference between B and B times K becomes R times E. Yeah, our low norm matrix times the low norm vector. Well, a low norm matrix times a low norm vector is still a low norm vector. Yeah, so they still remain close to one another. Not as close as before. They got a little bit further apart because we multiplied by a random matrix, but they still remain close. This is, by the way, why I, why I said that we only need T randomizable, because the more we randomize, the further apart they drift, and eventually they're going to drift too far apart, and we're going to reject the key. So we can only re-randomize T times. Great. So it's like we're off to a good start. Yeah, this is kind of the... First thing that we, we tried, surprisingly, this doesn't, this doesn't work, yeah? So, good. So, uh, so, great, we have a scheme. So the question is, is, I guess I gave it away. The question is, is it secure? So let's look at the analysis. So it's not so hard to prove a theorem 
this shows that the scheme actually is unlinkable. So if you re-randomize, in fact, the, the commitment you get is, um, is unlinkable to the original commitment. And this is based on the standard learning with errors problem, which I'll explain what that is in just a second. Great. And the proof, you know, this is, I'm not going to go through the proof. It's not a very interesting proof. It's kind of a standard argument using LWE and the leftover hash lemma. It's, this is kind of, for a cryptographer, this is like literally bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, we, do this, we do this in our sleep. Uh, so not a very difficult proof. Uh, but I guess now I have an opportunity to show you. I'm not sure if everybody is up to speed on the world of lattices. So just to, make, to, to, to show you what these assumptions look like, uh, let me explain what the learning with errors assumption is. I have an opportunity to explain this. So let me show you uh, what the assumption is. Uh, and the assumption, I'll describe it in kind of, uh, well, I'll describe it the way I like to describe it. Um, so again, we have these parameters, the prime, the dimension, and the noise distribution. And just so you see real numbers, the primes tend to be relatively small. So like they're 15-bit primes. Uh, the dimensions are in the hundreds. Yeah, so these are big, big vectors. And the variance is actually, again, very small. The, the noise distribution is literally numbers between minus 5 and 5. It's kind of a Gaussian uh, between minus 5 and 5 with variance of 1.75. Yeah, this is from one of the NIST candidates for uh, post-quantum key exchange. So you can see very concretely. By the way, the fact that these primes are so small is why these lattice systems actually work so quickly. Because we're not dealing with, there's no big number arithmetic here. We're just dealing with very, very small numbers. Computers love these things. And so uh, this is why this is so fast. What does the assumption say? The assumption basically says that um, if I choose a random vector s, yeah, so it's an n-dimensional random vector s, and I give you two boxes. One box basically will spit out uh, vectors of the form, well, a1, a2, a3, these are the vectors, and then scalars of the form a1 times a secret vector plus noise, a2 times a secret vector plus noise. Yeah. Uh, if I give you this output versus if I give you just vectors with random scalars. Yeah, so here you can see the definition of what these things are. So random vectors plus well-computed scalars or random vectors with random scalars. The assumption says there's no quantum polynomial time algorithm that can distinguish between these two boxes. Yeah, that's the assumption. So it's kind of it's, uh, it's a very interesting. For example, if the noise was zero, if all the noise value were zero, this would be false. Right? Because if all the noise values were zero, then after a few samples, you'll be able to solve for s. And then you'll be able to check that all the results actually look like s. So it's kind of this remarkable thing that by throwing in a little bit of noise into these relations, you make the scalars look um, indistinguishable from random. That's what the LWE assumption says. And there's this classic result of Regev that says, if in fact you gave an algorithm for LWE, then, um, in fact, this would give us a way to solve a difficult problem, that something we believe is hard for a quantum computer. Yeah, the approximate shortest vector problem. Yeah, so a lot of the NIST candidates are based on variations of this, based on ring LWE. So I think it's actually good, for, if somebody hasn't seen this, I think it's good to stare at this for a little bit, because just so you understand, like, uh, in 15 years, most of, uh, well, I should say, um, kind of many of the post-quantum candidates that will be deployed in the real world are going to be based on assumptions of this flavor. Yeah, so literally the security of the internet is going to start depending on these types of assumptions. So it is really kind of important to understand the quantum security of, these, of this type of assumption. Yeah, so um, I would argue that it's pretty important in the next couple of years that a lot of the folks who are specialists in designing quantum algorithms think more about, you know, what is the best algorithm for, uh, for kind of resolving the LWE question, just because this problem is going to become so important for the health of the internet. Okay, that's a bit of an aside. Now let's go back to our, to our main story. So the question is, remember we had our re-randomizable commitment example, and it was unlinkable, just like we needed. Once you re-randomize, everything becomes random. What, what was the other property of a commitment scheme that we needed? It needs to be re unlinkable. What was the other property? Binding. It needs to be binding. So the question is, is, is this commitment scheme actually binding? In other words, is it really difficult to find a commitment, B and B, and two different keys such that B times K is close to B is close to B times K prime? Right? That, if we could do this, this would break binding. And in fact, it turns out it's not that difficult to show that, in fact, for a random matrix B, 
this is difficult. You can't do this. Yeah, just secure. There's just no k and k prime will be mapped close to one another. The adversary can choose the commitment adversarially. Right? The problem is b is not random. It's chosen by the adversary. And actually, if you think about this for a second, you'll see the adversary can choose a matrix B for which this problem is trivial. For example, if the matrix B is made up of low norm columns, you know, vectors of low norm, then in fact, any low norm K will collide with any low norm K prime. And boom, we, have, we broke binding. And this is not just a theoretical attack, this actually would break the SSLE. Yeah, the protocol just stops being secure. So this construction just doesn't work. Yeah, it's kind of the first thing you try just doesn't work. And what's even worse is you try to, 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 to kind of hope that you can fix it quite easily, but the trivial fixes don't work. For example, maybe we can uh, fix the matrix B as part of the trusted setup process. Or maybe we can generate the matrix uh, not as a random matrix, maybe we can generate it as a, as a random oracle applied to some seed. Yeah, so we generate the matrix, derive the matrix from some seed, so we force it to be random. So it can't be, so the adversary can't just choose whatever uh, matrix it wants. But the problem with these two solutions is they break the re-randomization uh, mechanism. So we can't, if we do this, either one of these, we can't re-randomize the commitment anymore. Yeah, so like the obvious solutions uh, don't work. So we need to invent something new. Yeah, and so the first step uh, is solving this problem. And so let me show you the solution. The solution is basically to say, well, you know, there's this observation that it's true that, that uh, in fact, you can cause collisions, but in fact, if you choose random k and k prime, there are very few matrices that will cause these values to collide with one another. Yeah, they exist, but they're very rare. Yeah, and so what we'll do is, if we choose enough random vectors, enough random k1 to kl, then in fact, you can argue that with very high probability, there is no matrix, there, there are no collisions among these, these set of vectors. Yeah, so that's kind of the observation. And that's going to be our way out. And so the actual commitment scheme, what we'll do is rather than, if you remember before, we used a single vector. Now, in, instead of committing to a single vector, we're going to commit to a matrix. This is going to be, we're going to expand this into a matrix away from a vector. And in fact, this matrix that we're going to, that's going to, we're going to use as a key is going to look like just uh, basically L random vectors. And we force it to be L random vectors by basically using a hash function. Yeah, so which, which will model as a random oracle. So kind of we force the adversary to use a random key. The matrix we have no control over. The matrix can be arbitrarily adversarial, but the key we can force it to be, um, to be a random looking vector, a random looking matrix. Yeah, and the point is everything works the same. So to verify, you're just going to reveal the seed and you're going to check these L2, L2 norm conditions and re-randomization re works exactly as before. Okay, so that's kind of the... Uh, almost the final construction. And you can, now you can prove these two theorems. The, the scheme is binding, assuming the, 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 the um, hash function is a random oracle. And the point is now the scheme is also, sorry, it was unlinkable, unlinkable is easy. Now it's also binding using H being a random oracle and we still preserve the unlinkability. So now we have the two properties that we want. Yeah. How, how big should I think of LS? Um, yeah, so okay, so asymptotically, it's just logarithmic yeah. in the, you know, in logarithmic in the security parameters. In reality, it's going to be also in the, in the probably around 100 or so. So not too bad. Okay. Yeah. I think I have another question on Zoom. So the question is, if you fix B in the setup procedure, the matrix B, can you re-randomize? And no, the answer is you cannot re-randomize because re-randomization required changing the matrix. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that unfortunately doesn't work. Yeah. Cool. Good. It's a good question. Okay, great. Are we done? Yeah. So, th but this requires all of these L vectors to be randomly chosen, right? Well, we force them to be randomly chosen by choosing them from a, by choosing them from the hash function. Here we go. Here. Yeah. So they're not actually uh, adversary doesn't get to choose the the vectors however it wants. It has to choose a seed and then derive them from the hash function. And you have to prove that as well, like. Give well, no. You just no, no. You reveal the seed. And then the verifier that verifies the key will compute the hash function on its own. Okay. Yeah, and that's how it works. And by the way, it's interesting. This is exactly why the binding depends on H being a random oracle, because we do need these, uh, these vectors to be, to be random looking. Yeah, and the random oracle will guarantee that. Yeah? When you're re-randomizing, will the uh, re-randomizer need to prove that it multiplied correctly by a small matrix? Ah, 
Fantastic question, Lara. Fantastic. That's exactly where we're headed. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Couldn't, you couldn't have asked that at a better time. <laughs> so, so the question is, are we done? Well, unfortunately, there are more problems. So it's interesting. There are more problems. These problems don't come up in the Diffie-Hellman case. In the DDH case, all this stuff is like not a problem. Here, all these problems come up. It's exactly what Lara was asking. So if you think back to our definition of unlinkability, remember we said that if you re-randomize i0 times, it looks the same as re-randomizing re i1 times. Well, that's assuming re-randomization is done honestly. But what if re-randomization is done dishonestly? Then it turns out we have a problem. Yeah? So it turns out uh, you, you'll break unlinkability, which again breaks the SSLE uh, protocol. So let's define, so we define actually a stronger notion of re-randomizable commitments. We'll say that they're strongly unlinkable if they're unlinkable, even if the re-randomization is done adversarially, which is what you're asking, right? What if you choose a malicious matrix R, right? And it turns out that the DDH construction is strongly unlinkable, trivially. This problem just doesn't come up in the DDH world, whereas what I just showed you is insecure. Yeah, it's not that hard. That's actually, it's a little tricky, but it's not too hard to show that it's insecure. There's an attack. There's a real, but like what you said, Lara, actually leads to a real attack. And so, okay, now we're getting short on time, so I'll just say there's one more step we need to take to immunize the construction again, to make it strongly unlinkable. So there's one more immunization step that maybe I'll leave to the paper, uh, and so we can, get, we can get actually a strongly unlinkable scheme. Yeah, and so now we get, uh, so now we have a re randomizable co commitment. We have to marry it with a proof of shuffle. And so which proof of shuffle works with this commitment? It turns out we can use um, an adaptation of Bayer Groth uh, to the ring LWE settings, and we get a nice uh, proof of shuffle, uh, which, gives, which gives us an efficient uh, SSLE overall. Yeah, so that's kind of the end of the story. And I'll say, uh, who is asking about posting? Oh, you're asking about posting things on chain. So this, is, this, this bullet addresses that issue, that in fact, when you implement this in practice, like in WISC and in some other papers, you don't re-randomize the whole set, you just re-randomize a small set, a small portion, and you use kind of a rapidly mixing process that even if you re-randomize a small, shuffle a small set, it very quickly converges to, um, to a uniform distribution. Yeah, so you don't have to write on chain, you don't have to write that much data every time. Yeah, and maybe I'll leave this also for the, for the paper. Yeah. LWE, do you do everything sort of you describe things based on plain LWE? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we give we give both. Yeah, okay. so the, the paper basically gives constructions from LWE and from ring LWE. The ring LWE is actually more efficient, so probably that's what you'll end up using uh, in the real world. And uh, yeah, so this gives us this post quantum security. And so yeah, I think I'll stop here basically. This is, um, I think there's a lot, still a lot to do here in the post quantum setting. So the question is, could we have other lattice-based SSLE schemes? In particular, there is a, again, there's a very nice uh, lattice, uh, sorry, there's a very nice pairing-based paper for uh, SSLE from uh, the same group, CFG. Um, and one thing, if people are interested in working on this, it'd be nice to look at this construction and convert it to the lattice settings. I sh showed you the re-randomizable plus shuffle construction. There's a whole other path to SSLE that would also be nice to convert to the lattice settings. So there's actually more, uh, more work to do here. But uh, yeah, that's where we are. So now there's a, there's, a post, there's a post quantum alternative to SSLE, so you can feel safe in deploying the Diffie-Hellman SSLE. You know, if the world collapses and tomorrow somebody builds a quantum computer, we have a fallback, and uh, you know, we're, we're hap ba back to our, to our happy state. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening. Happy to take any questions. Great, yeah, please. So one component of this was the randomness beacon. Yeah. Uh, what, what are like post-quantum solutions for randomness speaking? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's because a good for the full thing to be post-quantum, that one also has to be post-quantum. Yeah, so I guess I guess what you're asking is, uh, do we have a post-quantum VDF, right? Yeah. And so the answer is yes, we do. Uh, so the VDFs, you know, the VDF that actually is going to get deployed is a hash chain-based VDF. How do you prove that? How do you uh, prove that the VDF is computed correctly? Well, you give a snark proof that the hash chain was computed correctly. So now we just need a post-quantum snark proof. And what's that called? So one example is the Stark system. There are other. There are lattice-based, yeah, there are lattice-based post-quantum systems. But one example of a post-quantum proof snark system is, 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 is Stark, right? So you could build a VDF by using uh, a post-quantum hash function, which is easy, along with a, with a Stark proof. Yeah? That's like a lattice-based VDF. It's a... Yes, yes, absolutely. 
a lattice based VDF would be would be awesome. That's a fantastic open problem. Yeah, I guess and I guess you would have to. Well, I, I guess if you could, we have lattice based snarks. So I guess you could just take the hash chain one and combine it with a lattice based snark. But like a, a native lattice based VDF, that's a fantastic question. Yeah. So please solve it. Yeah. It's a really really nice problem to work on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Please, Laura. Build for lattices, uh, probabilistic, Which one? probabilistic oh, 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 that's a great question. So, so what we would need is a VRF, right? So, do we have a lattice based VRF? There's a construction I can show you later oh, yeah. if you're interested, but there's a hash based slotted VR. It's, it's not a VRF, but it's a VRF. It's like a slight relaxation of a VRF that works for probabilistic leader election and it only uses hash functions. It's really, it's really simple. There's like a hash chain and uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, great. Yeah. All you need is hash functions for a probabilistic leader election. Ah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Oh, ha hash functions are sufficient. Yeah, good. I see. So you don't even need lattices. You can just rely on hash functions. Yeah. yeah. Even even easier. But for but if we go back to the VRF question, I guess um, well, there's a generic answer. If because if once we have a lattice based snark, we would and a lattice based PRF, we convert it and we can convert it into a lattice based VRF. But there is this hash basis like slotted VRF. The restriction is that you can only compute it once per slot, but that's mm. all you need for That's all you need, yeah. PLA. Good, 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 good. Because you basically yeah. reveal like your key for that slot, which is the spot in the hash chain. And then, yeah. yeah. So, so, so just to maybe to summarize what Joe said for the people in, at home. Uh, so Joe is saying that there is a very simple construction for PLE, probabilistic leader election, just from hash functions. You don't need anything other than hash functions. That's great. So then it'll definitely be post quantum secure. Yeah, please. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, it seems that you need both random big and the random shuffle. It seems to me that these two things are, are the same. Um, oh, a random beacon and a random. Well, OK, not, not quite, right? So a random shuffle, or rather a, a shuffle proof, is married to the uh, commitment scheme we're doing, right? You're, the shuffle proof you're doing is you're re randomizing the particular commitment scheme that we have. And then you have to argue that the committed values on the input side are equal to the committed values on the output side, modulo the order. So that's more specific to the exact uh, construction of the commitment scheme. Whereas a, a beacon is just generic. It just gives you random bits. It doesn't care about the commitments. Um, uh, so what you need is a proof of for permutation. Yes, exactly, I, I, exactly. Okay. So you need, to, exactly, you need to argue, you need to prove that the output is a permutation of the inputs. Right, nothing was added, that's nothing was dropped, and nothing was changed. Yeah, and that's what these proofs of shuffle do. Yeah. So we have we have pretty we have very good ones, uh, and that's that's what gets used here. In fact, the the uh, WISC construction, um, one of the the things the very cool things they did is they really optimized the, the proof of shuffle to get it kind of as efficient as possible. That was very very cool work. Yeah, cool. It's a great question. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah.